Now, we have some work that we're going to do on today. Y'all ready? I've been waiting for you at the door. <laughs> we have some work that we're going to do. I want to start off by saying this. Um, about four weeks after Josiah was born, and I wasn't as sleep deprived as I was from his birthday, as I was praying and really seeking God, this is the series that he birthed in my heart. Love is. And the reason he really gave me this series is really twofold. Number one, the purpose is for us to become accurate. Can I get somebody to say accurate? Accurate, accurate biblical billboards in the earth that display God's love, that display God's grace, and also is to rid our hearts of being stony. Have you ever met a professing Christian that has a stony heart? Hard hearts. Somebody putting people on blast. <laughs> Hard hearts. But listen, I, I understand it and I get it because a lot of stuff that we have gone through has been hard. That, that divorce, that was hard. That church hurt, that molestation, that was hard. And so what the enemy desires to do, like I articulated to us several times, is trauma is hell's attempt to bookmark your story. You're never going to get past this. You're never going to heal from this. You're never going to recover from this. Not only is trauma hell's attempt to bookmark your story, it's also the enemy's attempt to get our heart to be hard in the areas that God needs it to be soft. Did y'all hear me? It, it's, it's the enemy striving to get our hearts to be hard in the area that God needs it to be soft. And if you listen for any amount of time, sometimes I'm up here sounding like a Christian therapist. I'm passionate about healing. You know why? If you study the Gospels and the life of Jesus, you will see that one of the core values, the pillar of the ministry of Jesus was deliverance and healing. Y'all don't believe me, so let me give y'all a Bible. We're going to give y'all a Bible early, okay? I want y'all to see this early. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. Somebody shout, heal. heal! Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. It said, when evening came, if you don't have it, you can look on the screen. This is all intro, by the way, just while we're doing this. When evening came, they brought to him, speaking of Jesus, many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out spirits with the word, and healed all who were ill. This text is showing us that the king of glory is passionate about healing. And so am I and so should you be. Let me give you more Bible. Matthew chapter 15 verse 30. It says a large crowd came to him bringing with them those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others. See, the biblical church doesn't hide issues. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. A large crowd came to him bringing with them. I, I'm, I'm going to get serious about the Lord when I get there, when I get right. Okay, they brought those who were lame, crippled, blind, mute, and many others, and they laid them down at his feet. And he healed them. Right here in the second passage of scripture, we're seeing that the king of glory is passionate about healing, and so am I, and so should you be. Let's keep going. More Bible. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus was going through all the cities and all the villages, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness because the king of glory is passionate about healing and so am I and so should you be. One more, Luke chapter 9 verse 11, but the crowds were aware of this and followed him and welcoming him, he began to speak to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had the need of healing. For me, 
one of the multifaceted purposes of church is for us to do exactly what we see Jesus doing, speaking to them about the kingdom of God, making disciples so that people can be cured. I wanted to start this off by giving you book and chapter, verse after verse. We don't preach opinion here. We preach doctrine. So healing is so important because if I was a note taker, I would write this down. Healing is important because as you heal, the wounds take less of your focus. <laughs> as you heal, your wounds take less of your focus because healed people see different. Healed people think different. Healed people have a different perspective. Healed people. Can I go a little deeper? Your attention is currency, which is why it's called paying attention. Ooh, here's a whole question. Who are you giving a salary to in the form of your attention? Because your attention is currency. So when you do not heal, your wounds have you on payroll. The tension is currency. I'm doing this series in collaboration with the Holy Spirit as what he put on my heart because God wants us to be biblical Christians. And secondly, I desire and God desires to remove stony hearts from his people. Because hear me, you cannot have a loving heart and a stony heart at the same time. I know it's going to get real on today, and that's cool. That's cool. All throughout this series, I'm going to keep on saying it. The DNA of the Christian, love, repentance, obedience, and giving God glory. And we will be tested in this area. Some of us have already got tested. After part one, your love was already tested. We will be tested because anytime you get a word... It's always followed by warfare. Gosh, I wish I would have had this years ago. Anytime God gives you a word about what he's going to do, what he needs to do through you, what he desires to do, anytime God gives you a word, it's always followed by warfare. Come here, let me give you Bible. Disciples, let us go over to the other side. And as they're going over to the other side, they encounter a storm of hurricane proportions. They get to the other side and encounter a man that has a legion of demons on the inside of him. Because whenever God gives you a word, it will always be followed by warfare. Don't be confused from it. Be confirmed by it. So good. Give you more Bible. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. He goes, he tells them they're plagues, and eventually once they get let go, the children of Israel are walking towards the promised land, and then the, the children of Egypt are coming behind them to take them back. Because whenever the enemy sees that you're heading towards an upgraded level, he always tries to get you to revert back to familiar chaos. Whenever... God gives you a word. It will always be followed by warfare. Love, that's the DNA of the Christian. And it will be tested. But my desire is through our healing and through our devotion, we'll be able to show people we've studied. Y'all missed it. One more time. Love is the DNA of the Christian, and you will be tested. But by our love... And by our healing, we'll be able to show the world, I studied. <laughs> God, you're awesome. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this hour. We pray, God, that you forgive us for all of the times that we have been distorted representation and not representing you well. All of the study, all of the preparation means nothing if you are magnified and if you aren't glorified. And just like I asked in private, I now ask publicly once again, use me as your oracle the soundtrack, the PA system of heaven. We're asking that you do it. And everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you shout in the room, amen. 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 And amen. I hope y'all are ready because today, 
there is a biblical construct as we are now in installment number three of our Love Is series. There is a biblical construct, an attribute, a quality, if you will, of love that might be education to some and it might be a reminder to others. And that is love holds no record of wrong doings. Love holds no record of wrong doings. Let's speak around this thought from this subject, I got receipts. <laughs> I got, not I have, but I got. Somebody say got. got. I got receipts. This, this is biblically founded in a very, very familiar passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 and 5, where the text tells us, love is patient. Love is kind. Uh-oh. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. So you do know cursing somebody out is dishonoring. Okay? It's going to be rough in here today. All right. <laughs> it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. But I love you, girl. <laughs> then why is your fuse like a firecracker? It is not easily angered. It keeps some records. It keeps a few receipts. <laughs> but that was toxic, so it keeps toxic records. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. This is really showing us the DNA of love. Like five chromosomes, if you will, of love can be found right here in this text. And it's saying love does, love does not, love always, love never, love is not. It's showing you how to build the DNA strand of love in the heart of the Christian. Love is. Love does. No, love does not. Love never. Love always. Love is not. So it's really saying sometimes love can be seen by what you do. Then other times love can, love can be seen by what you don't do. And out of all of these different attributes of the text that the Apostle Paul was explaining to the Corinthian church, we want to park, pull over, put a quarter in the meter, and spend the rest of our sermonic journey on this afternoon around, I got receipts. Let's focus on the part that love holds no record. Let's focus on that part. Why, Pastor? Because... You cannot hold a record against them and display the love of Jesus toward them at the same time. <laughs> one more again, not one more time, one more again. You cannot hold a record against them and then display the love of Jesus towards them at the same time. Because love holds no records. Love holds no receipts. Some of us are like, I got so much receipts. Okay, just in case we don't know what receipts are, I know I'm speaking in millennial terminology, but let me break it down, okay? A receipt is a detailed account. <laughs> it's going to come for your neck on today. It is a detailed account. You got saved voicemails. You got saved text threads. 
You got pictures. Come on, talk to me. You got screenshots. You got DMs. You got locations. You got addresses. Y'all don't want to talk to me. I got receipts on them. <laughs> I got receipts. Receipts is a detailed account that contains a flaw, fault, or an offense that you have saved in your heart that's against a person, a people, or against yourself. Receipts. I got them. Some of us are like, I got so much tea on them. I have receipts. But you cannot hold a receipt against them and display the love of Jesus toward them at the same time. Because love holds no records. Let me mess you up a little more. Keeping tabs. Y'all should see y'all face. <laughs> Keeping tabs are holding a record is an emotional bill that you keep paying with your peace. <laughs> Holding records, that's an emotional bill that you keep paying with your sleep, that you keep paying with your joy, that you keep paying with your confidence, that you keep paying with your security, that you keep paying with grace. You're paying for it. It is the role that you are playing in your own suffering. Because I got receipts on them. And how you steward your current wounds will affect how you see. How you steward what hurts you will affect how you see people. Your perspective is eroded and corroded by the receipts that you hold in your heart. But I cannot hold a receipt or a record against them. And display the love of Jesus toward them at the same time. So you are either treating people out of the love of Jesus or you are treating them out of receipts. Wow. Wow. See, some of us, <laughs> some of us are like this. I actually did this, okay. Um, some of us are like, okay, they didn't invite me to the party, all right. You show right. I got receipts. Okay, they said something smart to me and they bad mouthed me. Okay, I got receipts. Y'all hear all that? <laughs> okay, I asked my husband to do this and he didn't keep his word. I got receipts. Y'all hear this? So, so what happens, truthfully, for a lot of us, is before we ever encounter Christ, we encounter receipts. And we are literally, literally walking around like, you know what? Last time I asked them to do this, they didn't show up. Somebody say, I got receipts. And truthfully, I think this is how a lot of our thought process, this is how it sounds. Let me put it in the mic. You have receipts. You have a fence around you of receipts. You can't enjoy church because you come with a church hurt receipt. You can't experience anything new because you have receipts from something old. You're walking around with receipts. <laughs> receipts. Your kindness, that's incarcerated to your receipts. Your grace extension, that's incarcerated to your receipts. You showing off the love of Jesus to others, that's incarcerated to receipts. You being able to sleep at night, you can't sleep because all night long, your mind keeps sounding like receipts after receipts after receipts. And I can't experience the peace of Jesus because I have the receipts from people. Receipts. <laughs> receipts. A lot of us, this is how you walking around in the spirit. Let me rip where you get more. Some of us got several receipts. <laughs> you walking around 
like this, holding receipts, but professing I've received grace. Receipts. Somebody shout receipts. receipts. And if we were to go a little bit deeper and really start to break this down, you're starting to make decisions from receipts. We're having a, a get-together at church. You have to book a session with your receipt first before you can even respond to the invitation. Receipts. Can I go deeper? Yes. Holding a record of wrong or receipts is actually bitterness playing dress up. Let me go ahead and come for your neck, okay? The soil of bitterness begins as the seeds of receipts. Why am I so bitter? It's because of all the receipts you have in your heart towards yourself, towards your mom, towards your ex-pastor, towards your ex-husband, towards God. You have receipts and you wonder why is the first emotion I feel anger? Why is the only emotion I feel is distrust? It's because your heart is filled with receipts. So the soil of bitterness begins as the seed of holding receipts. Can I go even deeper? I've discovered this through counseling a lot of couples and a lot of brothers. Many times, bitterness is grief that was never fully processed. When I'm talking, I'm hearing a eulogy that never happened. It's bitterness. Bitterness is grief that was never fully processed. So you're literally walking around with a decomposing body that you never buried. And the stench is getting on your attitude. The stench is getting on your perspective. The stench has permeated your mouth. The stench has permeated what you search and what you don't search. Because you never had a eulogy in your heart. You never had a eulogy in your mind. So you can't move forward. Bitter over what happened. It's grief that never was fully processed. Bitterness. Bitterness. But here's the thing. I cannot hold a record against you and display the love of Jesus towards you at the same time. Because love holds no records. I'm speaking to a married couple right now prophetically in the house and watching online. The cancer to your union, the virus to your marriage is you keep holding records on your spouse. You're not under attack. Your covenant is under receipts. And so you can't even see the areas that they are changing because holding receipts blinds you to growth. You can't see that they are trying because you got receipts. You can't see that he's trying to get better because you got receipts. So there's no grace because of all of the receipts. And single people, you're not off the hook. This Y'all like, yes, okay. <laughs> like, this is not confined to married or, uh, married or people in relationships. This is a biblical ethic for the Christian. In layman's terms, this is not an option, bro. Not keeping a record of wrongs is not an option for the individual who claims to be a Christ follower. Good marriages consist of good forgivers. Talk Holy Spirit. This, this series is hitting different, y'all. This series has a different level of oil on it. I could just tell. Listen, I, I, I'm trying to get us to really, really understand why we're not experiencing the blessings of God and the, the, the peace of God. And we want the promises the Bible speaks about, but we're not being the Christian the Bible tells us to be like. So some of the stuff that I'm preaching to you sounds like, ah, uh, sounds good. But I never experienced it. Have you ever strived to be a Christian? 
that keeps no record of wrongdoing. Now, Pastor, you don't understand. They just disappointed me. They disappointed me. I hear you. You're human. You have a right to feel disappointment, disappointed. But let me try to help your, your perspective of it. Disappointment is for revelation, not devastation. Changes everything. Disappointment is for revelation, not devastation. Okay? So when I understand and I get a revelation of the nature of a thing, its character never shocks me. Selah, let it sit for a moment. When you understand and have the revelation of the nature of a thing, its character never shocks you. I've never been shocked by a dog that barks. Oh, my God, it went roof, roof. <laughs> never. Why? Because I have a revelation of its nature, so its character doesn't shock me. I've never been shocked by a bird going tweet, tweet. That sound effect, though. <laughs> I've never been shocked by a bird doing that because I have a revelation of its nature. I understand its character. I'm not shocked by a baby crying. I understand its nature. And so its nature, since I understand its nature, I have the revelation of its nature, the character of it never shocks me. Never shocks me. See, we have to talk about this later on in the sermon. We're going to deal with, okay, hold on. It sounds good, but uh, how do you guard your heart with all, with all diligence and not hold a record against them at the same time? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But we have to deal with disappointment. You know why? Because when disappointment is not handled properly, bitterness will be born. It will. And we are not born in this earth realm knowing how to handle disappointment. You don't come here knowing how to handle loss. Kingdom love must be taught. I'm like, okay, if you want to be a hairstylist, you go to school, hopefully. <laughs> if you want to be a mechanic, you go to school. If you want to be a surgeon, you go to school. Why is it we have not gone anywhere to educate ourselves on how to love, but we think we know how to do it? In middle school, talking about, I love him. <laughs> what? <laughs> Kingdom love must be taught. That's what this series is about, is teaching us a biblical perspective of God's view of the Christian and what love is. And so I understand that this series might be difficult for people to digest. And I really believe this this, this series might be hard for people to digest for three reasons, especially this part about loving and keeping no records. The reason it's so hard is because, number one, trauma has attempted to rob your heart of the ability to love. It's hard to hear, digest, even put this in practice when we have unaddressed trauma because trauma attempts to rob your heart's ability to love. You don't come out of your mother's womb, paranoid. That's taught. That's made. That's built. Narcissists aren't born. They're made. They're made from childhood. They're made from bitterness. They're made from abandonment issues. This, it has to be taught. And so it's hard, which causes for us to engage in this, this therapy word called catastrophizing catastrophizing that is catastrophizing is when an individual believes that they're in a worse situation that they really are or a worse outcome is imminent you walk around catastrophizing everything you believe that you're in a worse situation than you really are or that a worse thing is bound to happen and you act like it you think like it you're prepared for it. Y'all should see y'all faces. <laughs> Can I give y'all a different perspective? Negative thinking many times 
is punishment we give ourselves because somebody else didn't keep their word. So what you're going to do is you're not going to talk because of who talked to you wrong. It's punishment we give ourselves because somebody else didn't keep their word, because somebody else didn't know kingdom love. Your perspective is shaped by the algorithm of your thoughts. Whatever you search on Instagram will eventually become your algorithm. So if you search basketball, eventually the algorithm in your feed is going to be a whole lot of basketball clips. It's the same way with your mind. My perspective is being shaped by the algorithm of my thoughts. The algorithm of my thoughts. I believe that's the reason why this series has been difficult for many people to digest because trauma has robbed our ability to love. Number two, the reason it can be so difficult for us to digest this word, especially this particular installment of this series, is due to what I call a perversion of defense. A perversion of defense. What is that? I'm glad you asked. A perversion of, of defense is expecting the worst. So I'm going to expect the worst to defend me from being disappointed. I'm not even going to expect something good to happen. I'm going to expect the worst because that's my defense for me being disappointed. That's the linebacker that prevents me from being disappointed. I never have to feel the pain of a fall if I don't climb. I don't have to feel the pain. I don't have to recover from a fall if I never climb. But here's the problem with that. You were not cosmically created by God to be a bottom feeder. We are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You were created to live at the bottom. You're not a bottom feeder. Everything that settles ends up at the bottom. Maybe... Maybe this is why some of us have such an unsettling in our spirit. Because the Holy Spirit knows you're settling at a level that's beneath what God has called you to. I just feel like something ain't right. I, there's just an unsettling. Maybe it's because you're trying to settle. It's a perversion of defense. Number three, why is this series so difficult? For many people to digest, ingest, and take to their spirit in areas where they need to change, it's because this series is putting our witness in the gym. It's putting our witness in the gym. God wants to give your witness some muscle. God wants to give your representation of the kingdom some muscle. It's your witness. See, everybody wants the blessings of being a child of God, but we don't want the responsibility of being a witness for God. See? See, it's our witness. He's placing our witness in the gym. And this series is hard because God has placed you in a gym and you didn't even sign up for it. What do you do when God puts your witness in a gym without your permission? He didn't allow you to pick which gym you're going to go to. He didn't tell you who would be your personal trainer. He didn't allow for you to pick which session you're going to go to. Is it the morning session? Is it the afternoon session? Is it the evening session? For some of us, you work out two, two, three times a day. I have to get your witness to get some muscle. What do you do when God places your witness in the gym? You work out. I'm trying to work out all of that cultural mindset out. I'm trying to work out all of that doubt from your mind. And I just have a sneaky suspicion 
even in the midst of a power surge, power outage, that there is a few of us in the sacred sanctuary in the house that feels like, you know what? If it's not kingdom, I don't want it. Is there anybody? Like, okay, if it's not kingdom, I don't want it. Worry, that's not kingdom. I don't want that. Entitlement, that's not kingdom. I don't want that. Rejection issues, that's not kingdom. I don't want that. You don't get mad at a shoe that doesn't fit. You just find your size. I don't want that. No, I want kingdom. I don't want abandonment. I want kingdom. I don't want insomnia. I want kingdom. I don't want fear. I want kingdom. I don't want to be depressed. I want kingdom. I don't want joylessness. I want kingdom. I don't want arrogance. I want kingdom. I don't want entitlement. I want kingdom. I'm putting your witness in the gym to give your witness some muscle. The peace that I have now is worth everything I left. Am I talking to anybody? The peace I have now is worth everything I left. I want kingdom. But I can't hold a record against them and display the love of Jesus toward them at the same time. So I want us to see this, this text, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. The reason I'm so passionate about this is because if we don't get this right, we will be distorted representatives. One of the reasons people don't do church now is because of people who do church now. I hear your confession. I see your post. I even see you shouting. But I don't see your love. You cannot love Jesus and treat people like trash. Somebody say, say it again. You can't love Jesus and treat people like trash. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, this is for all the deep people. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. <sighs> Make it personal as a church. All of us who went to volunteer yesterday, went to homeless shelters and the house of Yahweh, and we're giving to the orphan and the widows, we're doing all of that at church, as a church. Verse 3 says, if I give all possessions all I possess to the poor. And if I give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Somebody shout love. love. So I want us to say this confession. And then we're going to have one more foundational scripture. Can I get us to say, Father, Father. since you don't, Hold a record against me. Help me to not hold a record against others. One more time. Father, since you don't hold a record against me, help me to not hold a record against others. Okay. So Matthew 18, verse 21. We have a little reading to do. I want to know, are they still streaming or not? They are? Okay, good. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. I'm going to take my time with this because this is really the whole focal point of the whole sermon. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? 
<laughs> Peter sound like me, right? Us. Anybody can relate to Peter? Peter's that guy who will ask what everybody's thinking, but they are saying it. He's that guy. All right, I hear all that great stuff. Okay, but how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. I'd have been like 490 times. <laughs> Some of us have been like, bet. Okay, they messed up today. All right. Um, that is 489 times left. Okay. They, okay, bet. That is 400. <laughs> you got 300 left. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I do not tell you up to seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had. Somebody say whole bloodline. Blood okay. And that the payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I, and I will pay you all. The master of the servant, who was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out, found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and laid hands on him. That's what the Bible says. Okay? I thought I made that up. No, the Bible... And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. I was like, he's choking him. Some of us are choking people with, with the lack of grace. Pay me what you owe me. So his servant fell down at his feet and begged him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you. And he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told the master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant? Just as I had pity on you and his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he could pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. We're not going to say amen. Somebody say ouch. So I, I want us to understand. I, I never want to deliver a message that we fully don't understand. Okay, so some of us don't even understand what a talent is. Okay, so a talent means skill or I meant money. It's the largest unit of accounting in Greek currency, which is 10,000 denarius. Okay, so a denarius was equal to one day's wage. So multiply your daily wage by 10,000 and you get one talent. Okay? So whatever you make a day, multiply that times 10,000. So let's do a little math for a little bit, okay? So let's say somebody makes $50,000 a year. You work about 260 days annually. So 260 times 192 gets $49,920. We're going to round that to 50000 Say it again just in case I'm going too fast. You make $50,000 a year. You work 260 annual days of that year. So we're taking 260 times 192. We get 49920 which we're rounding to 50000 Okay. So what you do is 10,000 times 192 
and you get the worth of one talent. Does this make sense? Okay, so 10,000 times 192, because that's how much you make a day, you get 1.9 million. That's one talent. Somebody say one. one. Verse 24 said he owed him 10,000 talents. That is a lot. So now what we have to do is 10,000 times 1.9 million. You get 19.2 billion in debt. <laughs> so when he was standing before the king, if we understand this, like when we exegete scripture so that we can understand it, now we're like Jesus is giving a huge, large debt that all things being equal, we're not ever going to make 19.2 billion. Okay? So this is a debt you can't pay. You can't pay it. He says, okay, I'm going to forgive you of $19.2 billion. But with your brother and sister, you go. Okay. Okay. So you got receipts on your brother, on your sister. But you owe 19 point. Okay, we need to see this. Come here, Warren. All right. So this is what they did to you. This is what they said to you. Some of us, y'all got multiple receipts. I understand. God's like, okay, let me get your receipt. Go ahead and walk down the aisle, Warren. If I were to start to count all of the stuff that I have against you. If I want to really take your receipt, look down now, y'all. He's still going. He can really go around the whole building. He's still going. It's like, okay, you won't forgive because of what they said. You got receipts. I got scrolls. I got scrolls. Some of us, look, Warren is still going. Look, y'all, look, he's still going. I got receipts on you. All of this. Come on up here. Come on up here. Come on. Keep coming. I got receipts. You won't forgive? I can't even try to get all this up here. Okay, you don't want to forgive what they said? This is kind of how you look towards me. You don't want to forgive for what they did? If I were to be petty, what matter of fact, if I were to be accurate and just, and I were to show you all the stuff that you got, I got receipts. It's like, you got... I got tons of receipts on you. The, the, the porn, the lies, the false hypocrisy, the injustice line on in your taxes, adultery, masturbation, cursing people out, getting drunk, getting faded, pull up, drink, pass out, drink, headshot, drink, all the stuff I got on you. And you telling me you got receipts? But you don't understand what they did. You don't understand what I paid. I got receipts. <laughs> Chelsea's holding the roll. Chelsea, stand up. Well, I'm sorry. Stand up. That's Tiffany. Tiffany, you can stand. Look at this. All right, Warren, stop. I might need one more roll because I might need to re-preach. <laughs> the sermon got cut off when everybody watched online. So once everybody leave, I'm probably going to do the whole sermon again. <laughs> This is receipts. And he said, okay, I forgave all this. Didn't kill you. I died a death you deserved. He didn't just die for us. He died as us. But I, I sent my son so that when you stand before me, I'm not counting receipts against you. All I see is blood. I think this place should erect with praise right now 
because God doesn't hold $19.2 billion worth of sin debt on us, but the blood covered it. All of my imperfections, all of my failures, all of my inadequacies, all of my shortcomings. See, some of us get clapped over the sins that we recognize are wrong. What about the stuff you planned about doing that he still forgave you? I mean, you're repenting before you go. But then again, you're bitter because you got receipts. So let's give you these points and get out of here. Number one, forgiveness is not conditional. It's not based on somebody's response. It's not earned. It's not discerned. It's not bargained. It's, it's not paid for. It's not based on the promise that they won't do it again. Forgiveness is not conditional. If you say to someone, I'll forgive you if, that's not forgiveness. That's number one. Forgiveness is not conditional. Although, number two, Forgiveness is not minimizing. You molested my daughter. I forgive you, but I'm not minimizing what you did. You committed murder. You killed my brother. That hurt me, and I forgive you, but you still going to jail. Does that make sense? It's not minimizing what happened. It's releasing yourself. Hear me. Forgiveness frees the prisoner. And once you forgive, you recognize the prisoner was you. It's not about the offense of the offender. It's not even about their innocence. It's I got receipts on me. And I don't want to stand before the master with my receipts. So forgiveness is not minimizing. Okay? Number three, forgiveness is not resuming. Does this make sense? Okay. So you work here. You're stealing the tithes and offerings from the church. I forgive you, but you're not working here. Does this make sense? Okay. I'm not holding that against you. It's just forgiveness is not resuming. I'm getting ahead of myself. I was asking my wife, I said, how do we, how do we get a generation to understand that guarding your heart with all diligence and holding a record of wrong is not congruent. And this woman preached to me. She said, well, you're not angry at a snake. She said, you don't have a record of wrong against snakes, but you don't go to their habitat. You're not holding a record against a rattlesnake, but you know it's nature. See? A snake could shed its skin, but it can't shed its nature. When you understand the nature of a thing, its character will never shock you. So she was like, I think it's just knowing this is venomous. And that its nature is to bite. Right, right. So when you're guarding your heart with all diligence, that's, I understand this is venomous. Right, right. I'm not going to look for you to try to hurt you. I'm not going to try to kill you. Stay under your log, bro. Right, right. You're not invited to my house. Right. Not because of receipts, but because I know the nature. Does this make sense? 
I'm sorry. I'm just not one of them guys. You're not going to catch me on Animal Planet. Right here, I got a beauty. She's, oh, calm down, girl. Calm down here. She, no. I know it's nature. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's nature. I'm not going to do that. Number four, we'll end with this. Forgiveness is to remember your debt was cleared. So I was talking to my brother Warren, and I said, I always try to give the word that God told me to give. I try to study, even if it's hard. Cuts me sometimes, too. It's a double-edged sword. Cuts me and cuts those that hear it. And I said, you know, I think this sermon will be effective if it does two things. Number one, I just say what God told me to. And number two, if I can get everybody to leave thinking you owe 19.2 billion. If I can get everybody to imagine, and this is not even long enough, it's just a perspective, visual learning. I'm a visual learner. If I can get you to view yourself like this without the blood when they cut you off on 45 when you ask for Chick-fil-A salt well Chick-fil-A don't really mess up too much when you ask for ranch and they put mustard on your sandwich <laughs> when you're trying to be nice and they give you an attitude Before this, you think of this, you learn grace. Is this good? A new commandment I give you. To love one another as I have loved you. As by this all men will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, the greatest two commandments, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your heart, with all of your mind. And the second is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. All of the law and all of the prophets rest on these two commandments. And love holds no records you're so heavy because you have so many receipts I'm praying that God breathes on this series it's my prayer so that we'll reflect, reflect God's love and not their receipt God thank you for this word Thank you for reminding us that without the blood of your son, we have a debt so large we can't even pay it if we try. And all you ask is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from your wickedness. Love me, love others, and love yourself. It's the DNA of those who follow you is love, repentance, obedience, and giving you glory. Forgive us for having the arrogance of holding a receipt against somebody. When if it wasn't for Jesus, you got threads on us. And also, God, I'm praying that you will convict the heart of whoever it is listening to this to tell somebody I apologize, I forgive you. The married couple, the brother, the sister, the mother, we are not forgiving because we expect for them to understand and forgive us too. We're forgiving because you forgave us. 
whoever it is, give them the courage to release whoever has been incarcerating their peace because of all the receipts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Was this good for somebody? 19.2 billion. I want us to say this confession, uh, and then we're going to go home. If you haven't accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, I just want everybody to say this after me. I don't want to make the erroneous assumption that all of us know the King. So can I get us to say, God, I have a debt that I can't pay. And I'm so thankful that through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, if I put my faith in him all the debt can be forgiven thank you for salvation save me forgive me now change me disciple me so that i could be a billboard of the kingdom in jesus name amen